A very good evening. Many thanks for joining us on Nationwide on the network service of the NTA. I am Ifoma Ojinta. An extraordinary meeting of the Authority of Heads of State and Government of the West African Monetary Zone is now underway. President Mohamed Buhari is participating at the virtual meeting from the Executive Council Chambers of the State House. He has been joined by the Ministers of Finance, Foreign Affairs and the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. President of Sierra Leone, Ghana, Gambia, Guinea, and Liberia are also attending the meeting. Participants are expected to consider and discuss the implementation of the ECOWAS Monetary Cooperation Program, otherwise referred to as the ECOWAS Single Currency Agenda. State House correspondent the Musambo reports that the meeting is in forderance of efforts towards the emergence of a credible, unified ECO currency in the West African region. The American Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, has commended the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission for offering assistance in the investigation and prosecution of six Nigerians involved in business email compromise and wire fraud in the United States of America. United States Attorney Joe Kelly and Special FBI Agent Christy Johnson in a release made available to the EFCC commended the Commission for its past and continued assistance in pursuing those that engage in business, email compromise, and other fraud schemes. The six Nigerians indicted by the FBI are accused of violations of federal laws. The FBI described the EFCC as one of its foreign colleagues abroad and expressed appreciation for its commitment to working together the operation. Codenamed Operation Rewired was a hit against transatlantic syndicates of cyber criminals operating in intricate, sophisticated networks. 167 Nigerian suspected cyber criminals were arrested, and a total sum of 169,850 United States dollars and 92 million naira were recovered from the suspects. And a gang of four who specialize in generating and transmitting fake bank alerts were among 24 suspects paraded by the Nigerian police force in Abuja. Francis Form reports. A spokesman of the police force, Frank Mba, busy in the office carrying out his legitimate duties. But elsewhere, men of the underworld are using his name for criminal activities. Frank Mba Foundation is a creation of the criminals to defraud unsuspecting members on Facebook, soliciting for assistance for the purchase of palliatives during the COVID-19 lockdown with the perfected bank account. Luckily for us, our online intelligence monitoring team uncovered that plot before they could wreak much havoc. A 54-year-old man still in search of love allegedly lured a young Filipino woman from Manila to Abuja, cut see of the social media, and led her to his village where she was kept in an inhuman form for six months. For this gang of four, the use of fake bank accounts to pay for goods and services is their hobby. They monitor your transactions more like eavesdropping into your transactions and when it is time for payments to be made, they have the capacity to divert those payments to their preferred accounts. Laptops, mobile phones, SIM cards of different networks, ATM cards, fake US dollars, international passports, and other incriminating items were recovered from the suspects. In Abuja, Franks is from NTA News. Meanwhile, Casina Command of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, says it has seized about 361 kilograms of hard drugs from the beginning of this year to date. The state commandant, Momodu Suli, disclosed this at a news conference ahead 
of the June 26th United Nations International Day Against Drugs and Illicit Drug Trafficking. Abdul Malik Hassan reports. The theme for the 2020 International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking is Better Knowledge for Better Care. As the Casino State Command of the NDLEA joins the rest of the world to celebrate the day, it says frantic efforts have been made to rid the menace of illicit drug trafficking, stressing that it has apprehended 158 suspects and recovered 361.15 kilograms of hard drugs. The command, according to him, has also convicted 60 drug offenders as well as subjected four to rehabilitation. So once, when you have a problem, the more you talk about it, the more uh, people get to know it and the more we begin to think of how to address it. He said the command has only two functional vehicles to serve the 34 local government areas of Kasuna State. Meanwhile, Special Advisor to Governor Aminu Masari on drugs, narcotics and human trafficking, Hamza Borodo said the state government also constituted a tax force comprising members from all security operatives in the state to checkmate the influx of drugs in the state. In Kasuna, Abdul Malik Hassan, NTA News. It's now time to join Lagos Studio for more reports and Adiola will be our guide. Thank you, Ifoma. The United Nations set aside the 23rd of June annually to bring to the consciousness of all the plight of widows and the way forward. Annie Daniels in this report takes a look at the fate of widows in Nigeria amid coronavirus pandemic. After his death, I have to come back to Lagos. But to my surprise, after one year, we need to go back to the village and do, uh, they call it, um, yes, to remove your black cloth, yeah, memorial service. To my surprise, I wanted to enter my house and they said, the key is not, is not mine, it's with them. I said, what does that mean? He said, I'm the head of the home. The key is my, with my husband's senior brother. Then by the time I got back to Lagos, I said, what of my kids? He said the key belongs to him. That was a widow recounting her experience after losing her husband at a very young age. Such stories abound, especially in a situation where the widow is not empowered and do not approach relevant authorities to seek redress. It depends on the type of marriage. But I'm also aware that we have violence against persons, violence against persons act in Nigeria. And it is also one of the laws that a widow can avail himself of the provisions that does not discriminate against women. In the face of COVID-19, widows are calling for more assistance from relevant authorities. This is because, unlike previous years, when they were able to get assistance from organizations and religious bodies, which no longer is possible, as the social and physical distancing rules have put a hold on that. In Lagos, Annie Daniels, NTA News. Cases of the coronavirus pandemic in Nigeria continue to rise astronomically, while the latest statistics provided by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control reveals that there are more than 20,000 cases in the country. What is responsible for this rise despite all the necessary safety measures put in place? Imoli Ayotokide tells us in this report. Since the lockdown was relaxed by the federal government in the three states where COVID-19 was more prevalent, including Lagos State, business activities have gradually picked up. However, the use of face masks and obedience to social distancing, which are the major safety preventive rules to curb further spread of the disease, are slowly fading off as a large percentage of Lagosians now go about their businesses, throwing caution to the wind. Ike Wana and Savior Clement both sell wares under the popular Obalende Bridge. Like most people, they have grown complacent and abandoned the hygiene measures to protect themselves. These are their reasons. The virus is not in Nigeria. Why do you think so? I think so because I have been with different types of people in this country. I have never seen anyone say, you see, or here. That face mask, it depends my two ear. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for this place. Other respondents view the usage from the angle of discomfort. We are tired of wearing the face masks. In fact, uh, every day face masks, face masks. In fact, you know, it doesn't even enable one to breathe very well. So we are tired of the face masks. Please just be going normal the way we have been going before. For this commercial bus driver, Joseph Eze, who plies CMS to Obalinde and Ikeja. The transport regulation has not been easy to comply with. From charity, that is a carry for for who obey the law, carry to to upon that with the carry to do. I will make sure about uh, face mask. Conductor use face mask. Passenger before before I move my motor, uh, I make sure say passenger use face mask. Upon that, last mile is a drop us. Task force, if you dare for bus or task force to come block us. It is not a new fact that Lagos State is the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in Nigeria. This could be connected with little or no compliance with the safety measures. However, experts believe that the power to adequately tackle for the spread of the virus lies in the hands of every individual. In Lagos, in Moliari today, NTA News. A break beckons now. Thereafter, the news continues with Ifoma in Abuja. I wish to once again commend the frontline workers across the country who, on a daily basis, risk everything to ensure we win this fight. For those who got infected in the line of duty, rest assured that government will do all it takes to support you and your families during this exceedingly difficult period. I will also take this opportunity to assure you all that your safety, well-being, and welfare remains paramount to our government. I am using this opportunity to express our deepest condolences to the families of all Nigerians that have lost their loved ones as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is our collective loss, and we share your grief. and illicit drug trafficking is the focus this week on NTA Tuesday Live. What are the best practices and challenges in tackling the ills? What are the success stories in Nigeria as the world looks forward to the International Day against drug abuse and illicit drug trafficking? Join us on NTA Tuesday Live at 10.30 p.m. for this and more. Don't miss it. Babalola University at Dwekiti Abroad sympathizes with its alumni, undergraduates, prospective students, and parents over the closure of schools due to coronavirus pandemic. As we await the lifting of ban on schools, Abroad has put in place an elaborate arrangement to guarantee the safety of staff and students as they return. And this includes the provision of soap and water dispensers, infrared thermometers, disinfectant sanitary cabin, motorized modular fumigate, PCR machine, RNA extraction kits, COVID-19 test kits for antigen and antibody, nose masks, biosafety cabinet, a holding bay, and all other accessories to prevent COVID-19 infection and spread. At Abward, the health and safety of staff and students are our priority. Abward, a vision in action. NTA TV College Jaws, an affiliate of Ahmadu Bello University Zaria, is currently admitting students for its ordinary diploma programs in television journalism, television production, and television engineering. Interested candidates are advised to obtain relevant information concerning eligibility at our website at www.ntatvc.edu.ng or marketing department of any NTA station nationwide. For further information, contact Assistant Director Marketing, NTA TV College Jaws on 0803-314-4383 or the Academic Office of the College on 0806-980-9807. Announcer, Registrar. 
I just don't understand this coronavirus thing. Is it real? See, coronavirus, known as COVID-19, it's a global problem and has killed thousands of people in China, Italy, Spain, UK, US, and other countries around the world. Okay. Now, why are they saying that we should stay home? Because if you go outside and get in contact with someone who is infected, you become infected and then come back home, affect your family. That's how it happens in other countries. Yeah. Now, please help me explain what this social distance is all about. You see, as we are now, the virus travels through the air and by touch. We must maintain six foot distance at all times. Oh, so it's not by washing my hands with soap and water or hand sanitizer that is only important. Washing of our hands regularly is very important. But we must come together and fight this virus like we did Ebola. It is our responsibility to each other. Welcome back. President Muhammadu Buhari has made a case for ECOWAS leaders to bury their differences and commit to the emergence of a credible, unified and strong single currency ECHO in the West African region. He, however, is pressed concern over the suspicious actions taken so far by the West African Economic and Monetary Union on the issue, warning that progress must therefore be made with caution. The president was speaking at an extraordinary virtual meeting of the Authority of Heads of State and Government of the West African Monetary Zone. State House correspondent Adam Musambo has details. The crucial meeting which had in attendance the presidents of Ghana, Gambia, Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia was summoned to discuss and consider the implementation of the ECOWAS Monetary Cooperation Program, otherwise referred to as the Single Currency Agenda. And on this, President Muhammadu Buhari said remarkable progress has been made including the adoption of the exchange rate regime the name and model of the common central bank, as well as the symbol. He, however, expressed an easy feeling that Francophone countries under the auspices of the West African Economic and Monetary Union now wish to take up the echo in replacement for CFA franc ahead of the rest of member states. He noted that already French ministers have approved a bill to reform the CFA franc and most if not all the French-speaking countries of the ECOWAS have passed legislations to that effect in their parliaments. It is a matter of concern that a people with whom we wish to go into a union are taking these major steps without trusting us for discussion. We cannot ridicule ourselves by entering a union to disintegrate potentially no sooner than we enter into it. We need to be clear and unequivocal about our position regarding this process. We must also communicate the same to the outside world effectively. While restating the commitment of Nigeria, and indeed Nigerians, to the ECOWAS single currency, the president, however, made a case for the recommendations made by the Convergence Council to be critically considered so as to take a common position. He said the English-speaking West African Monetary Zone must be safeguarded from the pitfalls of a questionable union. President Buhari insists that steps must also be taken towards the evolution of a monetary union with the right fundamentals that will guarantee credibility, sustainability, as well as the overall regional prosperity and sovereignty. We have all staked so much in this project to leave things to mere expediencies and convenience. We must proceed with caution and comply with agreed process of reaching our collective goal while treating each other with uttermost respect. Without these, our ambitions for a strategic monetary union as an echoes block 
would be very well in serious jeopardy. The extraordinary summit was summoned at short notice despite the preoccupation of all countries with the overwhelming impact of COVID-19 on health and economies. From the State House, Adam Musambu, NTA News. <laughs>Now, promoting widows' rights and empowering them to break the circle of deprivation was in focus as widows observed the 2020 Inter International Widows' Day on the theme, Widows' Rights are Human Rights, Respect Them. And with me in the studio to discuss you know, issues still affecting widows here in Nigeria is Susan Noan. You are welcome to our studios. And happy privilege. International Widows' Awareness Day. It's a privilege. Okay, now, madam, we know that losing one's husband at any point you know, is not a good thing or a thing of envy. As a widow with children, how have you been coping? Thank you, ma. No, widowhood actually is an act of God. And we know that is inevitable. That is why somebody in, as a person or as a widow, I took it in good faith. And it has not really been easy. You know, the challenges has really been much. Especially when I was left with the issue of uh, feeding the children, paying their school fees, the issue of even having a place to put my head. And then when it comes to some issues of challenges, I notice that there is nobody again to run to as a husband. Mm -hmm. You know, a, an issue that we are supposed to have been handled by two persons. Eventually, you could see that it's only one person. And so actually, it has not been easy. Mm -hmm. and, okay. No, 
let's talk about assistance. Have you been receiving assistance from any quarters in trying to, you know, survive? Yes, we, we have an organization for the widows. No, it's the plights, our plights, and some of the challenges that uh, push us into coming together as a group so that our voices could be heard. Okay. And so we've had a lot of uh, assistance from the federal government. I remember this time that uh, some of us were given the, this BOI mon market money loans. Okay. Yes, it actually helped us, especially those of us that are into little trade. Mm -hmm. So that has been a great support. And it really went a long way to really help us to meet the needs of our families. Okay. Uh, now, with the outbreak of this coronavirus, you know, how have you been coping? Have, you know, governments come to your assistance in any way during this pandemic? Actually, we really appreciate the government for coming in. Through our mother, the Minister for Women Affairs, uh, Dem Pauline Talen. In fact, her concern has been the widows. I remember some few occasions we attended some program, and I remember all she could say was her problem was the widows, that she wished she could have a means to help the widows. So within this period of uh, COVID-19 challenges, we've had a lot of support through her assistance uh, by giving us palliatives mm. that really helped us and uplifted some of our burdens. And you could see that, yes, we are happy. Our women are happy, not only within the FCT, but in the whole nation. I even learned that this afternoon, some uh, palliatives were taken to Piakasa villages and then the, some other villages within the FCT. Okay. So we are really happy for her. She is really caring for us. Okay. You know, if not some, if if it we are not, if if it is, I mean, if somebody is not in our shoe, you will not really understand what the widows are passing through. But we thank God for having her, that really consider the the plight of the widows. Okay. Yes. Now, as we celebrate the 2020 International Widows Day, what are your expectations from government and the society? Yes, it's a privilege and we are happy to be celebrated this day. See, based on some of our challenges, as I've mentioned, we will want the federal government to come to our aid concerning the issue of uh, empowerment. We we'll still need more empowerment. They have done it, as I've said, through the market money. So wouldn't mind if they can empower us the more to help us meet the, some of the challenges. And then the issue of shelter. Right. There are some of our widows that are having the challenges of a place to put their heads. Okay. Yes, and they are numerous. If you give me time, I'll mention quite a uh, right. No, thank you. That will yes. be all for today. Thank okay. you so much, Susan Nguan. It's been a pleasure having you here on uh, Nationwide. And happy International Widows Day once again. It's a pleasure. Now, the authorities in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia says this year's Hajj pilgrimage will take place with very limited number of pilgrims will be allowed to take part. Ministry of Hajj and Umrah says only various nationals residing in the Kingdom will participate in the Hajj exercise. The ministry in a statement says the decision was taken due to the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. The ministry, however, says only a very limited number of pilgrims will be allowed with a view to ensuring Hajj is performed in a safe manner from a public health perspective, while observing all preventive measures and the necessary social distancing protocols. The Hajj exercise is to take place next month. And it's now time to join Felicia in just for more on Nationwide. Hello, Felicia. Former, glad to have you join us in JOS. Judicial offices across Plateau State have been properly formulated to ensure safety of workers and members of the bar on resumption of duty following the relaxation of the lockdown by the state government. Ijoma Ozemina was at some of the courts where work has resumed. 
Plato State Judiciary has ruled out new ways to ensure implementation of the protective measures against COVID-19 for the safety of its workers. The higher and lower calls have been mandated to reduce number of cases handled daily within a time frame. Litigants are expected to be represented by one person and not more than 20 persons should be seen congregating outside the courts. We also agree with lawyers that service should also be by text messages by calls and then uh, the documents will be uh, in the courtroom and when you bring your documents in we'll keep them for some time uh, to either sterilize them or sanitize our joy is that uh, people are, are now, uh, they need to know that courts have resumed and uh, whatever it is that is required of, of judiciary, they are ready to, to work. Our crew closely observed workers at the state high court, high court at West of Mines, Sharia Court of Appeal and Magistrate Court, wearing face masks, observing social distancing and personal hygiene. The Honorable Chief Judge also has said that you have three or four uh, defendants in a criminal matter, that means uh, one of them may be in the dock, but then you spread them in the courtroom. It was the view of all that judiciary still remains last hope of the common man in Jos Ijoma Ozemena, NTA News. As part of activities marking the International Widows' Day in Jos, the Widows' Comfort Outreach Ministry has organized a free medical service for widows and orphans in Plateau State. Sada to Mohamed Kafa reports. The global coronavirus has put on hold every facet of human activities, thereby making things hard for the vulnerable, especially widows and orphans who can barely afford access to medical facilities. For this reason, the Widows Comfort Outreach Ministry decides to reach out to this group of people in order to ease their medical burden. With all this pandemic, they cannot access the hospital. So with this now, volunteer, we, we employ volunteer doctors so that they can come and pharmacists and um, uh, technicians to come and treat them. We are giving up to 700 widows and uh, 100 orphans. Beneficiaries appeal for government intervention to alleviate the sufferings of widows and orphans. Many that come here today, they don't even have the money to buy the drugs. But today now, we have gotten our free medical. So we are, we are just telling the divisioner, thank you. And just of recent, not uh, so many years now, that uh, our leader find it possible to get help from hospitals or doctors that are willing to help the widows. The health services being rendered include blood pressure and sugar tests with free drugs given to them. In Joss, Saada Tumamad Kafa, NTA News. This is Nationwide. More reports in Abuja as we rejoin IFOMA. Thank you very much, Felicia. Now, there is no doubt that the novel coronavirus has turned the world of work upside down. This is evident in the fact that workers and businesses in every corner of the globe have been affected, leading to loss of hundreds of millions of jobs. Despite this challenge, some workers are still contributing their quota in ensuring that the world moves on until a solution is found for COVID-19. In celebrating the 2020 United Nations Public Service Day, essential workers and others on the front line are being celebrated. Adebola Brooklyn Sunday reports. In December 2002, the United Nations General Assembly adopted and designated 23rd June every year as Public Service Day, owing to their remarkable act of service to humankind in the midst of the outbreak of COVID-19. These set of workers are being celebrated. It's time for a coordinated global, regional, national effort to create decent work for all as the foundation of a green, inclusive and resilient recovery. Hilegogo Anthony is the Deputy Director of Chemical Pathology, National Hospital Abuja. He is one of the many essential workers on the front line to save humanity from the clutches of the unseen enemy, 
coronavirus. Some of our colleagues have been infected. So are we going to say because somebody has been be infected, I'm going to run away? We encourage them. We support them. But those of us that still in the, on, on the battlefront, we have to do what it takes. And thank government for considering to pay the allowances, special allowances for the frontline medical officers and other um, team, uh, team that are taking care of the COVID-19 patients. Okay. In achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, experts say effective delivery of public service is crucial. The e-learning platform has been upgraded and we have now and we have now brought in strategic partners to fast track the virtual learning training approach of the institute. And you have over 2,500 courses that you can key into online presently. And it's at no cost for now. The day which is domesticated by the African Union is also set aside to celebrate the value and virtue of public service to the community. So what member states should do, including Nigeria, is to declare this day to make it a public holiday. Because all of us are public servants, in as much as we are rendering services in one way or the other, including Mr. President himself. With COVID now, uh, it has shown us that digitalization is not an option. So we must uh, uh, marry the e-government master plan, support the federal government to uh, push it forward. Since 2003, it is the first time that the day has been celebrated without the usual public service awards to promote and reward innovation and excellence in public services by recognizing creative achievements. Adebola, Brooklyn Sunday, NTA News. Thank you very much, Adebola. And with me via Zoom to talk more on the contribution of frontline workers in this era of COVID-19 is Dr. Hakim Lawal of the National Hospital Abuja. Hello, Dr. Hakim. It's good to have you on Nationwide today. Um, Dr. Zainab okay. and all. Okay, now, uh, Dr. Hakim, we, we know we have a lot of you know, frontline workers ranging from media practitioners, the security agencies and all that. But what are those risks that frontline health workers you know, face in the line of their duty, especially in this area of coronavirus pandemic? Uh, well, thank you very much. It has always been the fact that you can contract the virus. Um, you, you understand why well, you're trying to offer care. We have health practitioners that um, go into the community, public health practitioners. You have um, those that are in the hospitals that attend to patients and all that. And so the fear of contracting virus is a very serious uh, uh, problem. It's also the problem of stigma. You know, in, in, in some clients, health workers have been known to be attacked because people who don't always believe that they are the purveyors of the virus. So where you live, um, you, you go back home and somebody thinks that you're the one that is um, bringing the virus from the hospital, uh, you know, and bringing it to the, their community and they start attacking you. That's what happened. That happened, I think, it was in the UK somewhere. There's also violence, you know, um, when you tell a patient that you're suspecting COVID-19 and uh, they, just, they may just slap you. And we've had documented cases of... Um, Health work has been assaulted at their workplace, nurses, um, doctors, and all that. Then, of course, uh, I wouldn't say this, but at times we are also at the receiving end of some security operatives. We, you know, health workers do night, night shifts, calls, and all that. You may just be returning from work, and uh, before you, at times you even show your identity. But they still harass you, you know, and you feel like, it's, you know, things can be better done. Um, so these are part of the risks we face. Um, you know, it's not just even the COVID. Last uh, everywhere, we are the ones at the front line that we have to interface. And we are also human beings. We are not. Um, okay, we are not uh, robots. Dr. Hakim. So we can, well, now, we Dr. Can Ak Hakim, aside um, health workers, you know, what other category of the workforce do you think uh, uh, could also be at risk? Um, yes. In fact, you speaking to me, journalists are at risk. You go to the field, you try to gather information and all that. You, you meet with people. Um, all those working in um, shopping malls, 
crowded places, churches, mosques, um, um, where people gather generally. Even security operatives are at risk. Soldiers, those that, you know, um, they because of the kind of work they do, they, they, they interface with people, they don't know where they, I mean, where, where, what, because it's not written on anybody's face whether you have COVID or not. And sadly, we're in the community transmission phase now. You know that majority, like 80% of people with COVID may not even show symptoms and they, are, they can transmit this virus. So like I said, um, the media workers, journalists, security operatives, everybody, you go to the market, people working in the market, you meet people. Okay, and, now, um, Dr. Hakim, how best do you think frontliners, you know, can be supported and motivated by government? Um, okay. Well, I can break into three. Um, of course, first is the fact that we want government pro to provide um, the multi tools, the equipment, the personal protective equipment, the PPEs, the masks, the gloves, you know, so that you are incentivized and you're not going with it's like a soldier going to the war front without the proof vests. You know, that could be very detrimental. And, um, so that's the first one. Of course, um, in order, I mean, we are happy government has uh, started responding in terms of um, incentives, financial incentives. The other allowance, um, so far, we are, we are, we are happy that um, um, health workers have started receiving um, their other allowance, which was negotiated. So that is, but beyond money, there are many ways to incentivize health workers. Um, for instance, tax reliefs, um, free. There are some international airlines offering free flights to health workers. They're just trying to appreciate the fact that we are heroes in this era of COVID, you know, where you can actually, you, you don't know whether when you go back, when you go into the, the work front, that you come back home with the virus. And of, of course, your families are also all, all right. exposed. And of course, there's thank, also the... Thank you, you know, very the, much, the Dr. Hakim. That that will be all for now. We thank you so much, you know, and I appreciate your sharing, you sharing your thoughts with us on Nationwide. Thank you very much, Dr. Hakim. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, it's now time to join the Barbary in our Port Harcourt Network Center for more on Nationwide. Hello, the Barbary. For joining Port Harcourt. High Court sitting in Port Harcourt has granted an interim order restraining the governor of Edo State, Godwin Obasemi, from participating in the Edo State PDP governorship primary election pending the determination of the suit brought from brought before from it by one of the governorship aspirants, Omorege Obedia Ihama. Case Liamaji reports. The plaintiff, Obedia Ihama, is seeking the Federal High Court to stop Governor Godwin from participating in the PDP governorship primary election. The court also granted the plaintiff leave to serve parties in the matter by means of substituted service. PDP and its national chairman, Uche Sekondus, INEC, Governor Godwin Obaseke, and the Edo State PDP governorship primary election committee are joined as defendant in the matter. The plaintiff equally sought the court's order to restrain INEC from recognizing Governor Basiki as PDP governorship candidate or any other person who did not purchase the form within the set time frame as the candidate of the party for the Edo State governorship election built for September 2020. All parties are expected to be in court on Thursday, June 24, 2020 for the accelerated hearing on the matter being a pre-election case in Port Harcourt, Kingsley, Amajuri, and TA News. To further promote cocoa cultivation for world creation in the post-COVID-19 era, farmers in Aquaibom State have been empowered with more cocoa seedlings to boost their productivity, not only for the needs of the state and country, but for exports. Udwak Etim reports that over 500,000 cocoa seedlings and other agro-based farm inputs were distributed to cocoa farmers in the state. Cocoa is one of the fastest selling and most desirable agricultural commodities in both local and international markets. Its demand is high, especially with the rapid demand for chocolate confectionaries and other related products. 
as a means towards boosting cocoa production in Nigeria. The Kwaibum State Government, through the Ministry of Agriculture and Women Affairs, has invested heavily on cocoa seedlings and other farm input for this year's planting. Farmers in cocoa value chain are the direct beneficiaries of this venture. I want to thank the state government of this cocoa. There's no way you can have food security and sufficiency without farm inputs. We thank the governor, His Excellency, for the love he has for the local government in particular. In a symbolic presentation of free cocoa seedlings and other inputs to farmers at the central North Rio Dorique in an illegal government area proves the fact that the Aquaibom state government is fulfilling its agenda of repositioning the agricultural sector for food sufficiency. For the beneficiaries, I want to appeal to all of them that they should be grateful to this government for the government to do more for them. The future of cocoa farming in Nigeria is dependent on encouraging younger generation into its cultivation for food security. Uduak Etham, NTN News. And as our bit from here is back to Informa for the rest of the news. Good evening. Thank you very much, Dibabari. Now, with the September and October off-season governorship elections drawing closer in Edo and Ondo states, opposition political parties have restated commitments towards peaceful electioneering. Timothy Yusuf has an update on this. From the major opposition political party, the PDP, the National Secretariat, has been a beehive of activities, with aspirants coming to either pick up expression of interest and nomination forms, or submitting same. Our primary election will be free, fair, clean, clear, and democratic. The situation is same at the National Secretariat of the Action Democratic Party, ADP. Political parties are very important. They are key elements of democracy, if you want to develop democracy in any environment. Meanwhile, it is another time for a reminder on political players that election is not war. We need peace in Edo. We need peace in Ondo. The bottom line is one person has got to run affairs of the state. Whether we like it's not going to be two persons. Our political parties must be seen and that they have internal democratic process. The Edo and Undo state's governorship elections are slated for September and October 2020, respectively. In Abuja, Timothy Yusuf, NT News. Meanwhile, security operatives have sealed off the National Secretariat of the All Progressives Congress as part of efforts aimed at resolving the party's lingering leadership tussle. In the early working hours of Tuesday, 23rd June 2020, staff of the Secretariat, including members of the National Working Committee, were denied access to the premises. We now take you to Madugri, where Abubakar is standing by with more stories. It's really good to see you, Ifoma, and thanks for joining us. The Ninth Senate has restated commitment to ending the insecurity bedeviling the Northeast sub-region. This was during a sympathy visit to government and people of Borno by the Senate high-powered delegation over the recent terror attack on some communities in the state. Mohamed Guni reports that the high-powered delegation was led by the Senate leader, Yahya Abdullahi. The sympathy visit by the high-powered delegation followed a resolution by the Senate to sympathize with the government and people of Borno over attacks on communities leading to loss of lives and property. Senate leader Yahya Abdullahi, who led the delegation, said the gruesome murder of citizens shook the entire nation and prayed Allah to grant the deceased eternal rest and their families the fortitude to bear the loss as well as to prevent future occurrence. Worried by the spread of killings, he added, the Senate had also set up ad hoc committee on security infrastructure as part of efforts to end the terror activities, the report of which was fully adopted. We do know and acknowledge and the whole nation is quite aware and very grateful of the kind of efforts that you have made and the brave journeys of work that you have made in your efforts to secure the people of your state. Professor Bagana Umara thanked the National Assembly for its concern to the Northeast, which was defeated by the establishment of the Northeast Development Commission. The governor also acknowledged successes recorded by the federal government and the military in the counterinsurgency operations. However, said the recent upsurge in violent attack is a concern to all, stressing nexus between peace, security, and development. In fact, the people of Bonos State are 
empiecen el día de su vida esta noche. To continue to dependence for food supply from international organizations and UN agencies is not sustainable. The governor expressed concern over inability of the citizenry to assess their farmlands and other means of livelihood, and further advocated enhancing capacity of the military and more funding to the counterinsurgency operation, as well as enrollment of the civilian JTF and hunters into the country's security architecture, among others. The delegation extended a similar message of condolence to the Shoho of Borno, where the need to urgently address the security challenges to enable people to return to normal life in Maiduguri, Mahmoud Goni, NTA News. 38,000 households taking refuge at the Shetima Ali Mongunu internally displaced persons camp in Maiduguri have benefited from the emergency food distribution exercise for victims of insurgency in the northeast region. The food distribution exercise is an initiative of the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, aimed at bringing relief to the internally displaced persons. Here are more details of the story. Expressing appreciation to the federal government for the food intervention program, some of his counterparts at the camp equally described the assistance as timely in view of the challenges posed to the economy due to COVID-19 in addition to the insurgency. The food distribution exercise has so far been described as impressive with each household getting adequate items. For now, we don't have any problem with them, and we are giving them their food. This one, we are giving them the monthly uh, June distribution, and hopefully by next month, before this, because of the rainy season, we are hoping to give them in time so that it will not affect any of the IDPs. The emergency food distribution in continuous exercise was flagged up by Vice President Professor Yemi Oshimbajo in June 2017, and it is expected to cover all the victims of insurgency within the northeast region of Nigeria. In Meduguri, Abu Bakr Mohammed Musa, NT News. That will be it from Meduguri. It's back to you, Ifoma, for the last segment of Nationwide. Good afternoon to you. Thank you very much, Abu Bakr. We now pause for another commercial break. The news continues shortly. Do stay. Guys, uh, let's do this. Action. You can deceive everyone, but you certainly cannot deceive me. I see you. But if the package is faulty, there'll be no bias. So I suggest you sit down and have a talk with your husband. Once you have faith, mm. everything is possible. Oh. You heard him, right? You needed help and I helped you. This place will do so. The doors will work. You mean you still work for Matthew Osage? What? We have observed the lockdown. We have practiced the measures in order to curb the spread of the virus, but we can do better. The coronavirus spread is increasing daily and only together can we cut down the numbers and defeat the spread of the virus. Remember, COVID-19 is not a death sentence and a recovered patient cannot spread the disease. Do not stigmatize. Do not hesitate to report any case or if you have come in contact with anybody that has been infected with COVID-19. If you have cough and fever, please stay at home and call your state hotline. Find state numbers at www.covid19.ncdc.gov.ng. Remember, it is for your own good and for the good of every Nigerian. Let us do better and defeat the virus. Together, we can do this. This message is brought to you by the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, Africa's largest television network. Yeah. So you cannot even support your husband? Eh? Support who? I thought you said men are the head of the family. How to get here? Oh no. Oh no. How to get here? Feminism is all about equal rights and opportunity for women. Settle your matter in your home. You can't keep comparing Agatha and Uchechi. Agatha is Agatha. Uchechi is Uchechi. Thanks for staying tuned.
President Mohamed Buhari commiserates with former Minister of Education, Mrs. Obiageli Ezekweseli, and her entire family over the passing of her mother, Mrs. Cecilia Wanyaka Udrubonu. In a letter of condolence, the President urged Ezekweseli, her family, and all associates of the, of the late mom to find strength in the good works of Mrs. Udrubonu, whose testimony of reverence for God and service to humanity continues to resonate. President Buhari condoles with the grandchildren of the late businesswoman and members of the redeemed Christian Church of God, knowing they will particularly miss her counsel and guidance, garnered from years of working hard to raise a disciplined and focused family. As the family mourns, the president prays that the Almighty God will grant them peaceful, grant her peaceful rests to the soul of the departed.